Welcome to Trail Tales ARP, a running podcast for every type of runner, with Sean Sobon and Russell the Runner. Hey everybody, welcome to Trail Tales ARP, a running podcast. Sean Sobon coming to you from Shelburne, Ontario, and Russell Levis all the way from Prince George, British Columbia. Uh, Russell, how are you today? I'm doing very well, thanks. We have a, a very excited guest on the show today, Sean. Absolutely. We have Rick Olderman with us today. He's an orthopedic physical therapist. Uh, he's been doing that for 25 years, and he specializes in helping people with chronic pain experience a pain-free life. Rick is also a podcast host. Uh, he hosts the Talk About Pain podcast, which is a series about eliminating pain. The beautiful part is without any medication or surgery. Uh, Rick is one of the top professionals in the United States when it comes to understanding recurring injuries and chronic musculoskeletal pain. He wants to enhance quality of life by helping people fix their pain once and for all. And uh, as runners, Russell, you know that uh, from time to time we we get some flare ups and some injuries and I'm dealing with a few myself right now. So I'm happy to have Rick on the show. Rick, thanks for being here with us today. Well, I'm, I'm excited to be here, Sean and Russell. Thank you. Yeah, so you've been you've been uh, helping people for the past twenty five years. Do you have a lot of experience with runners as well? Oh yeah, yeah. I uh, I owned a clinic uh, just until last year, and uh, lots of runners coming through, triathletes, cyclists. You know, a lot a lot of elite, more elite athletes, and so forth. No, yeah, so you've been dealing with some high level guys, eh? Not 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 a couple of hacks like us. <laughs> well, I, I think any anyone who's who's doing any kind of athletics is is an, is a high level because most people are trying to push themselves to the top level that they can get to. It seems this is true, and that's that's a very good point. And and I always state that you know when people tell me, oh, I'm not really a runner. I think you know if you've moved, it doesn't matter how far or how fast you go, you're a runner, right? And and you're really only having to compete with yourself and what your limitations are because we all have different abilities and capabilities. Yeah, I think I would be the exception to that uh, to that rule that, that you've created there, Sean. So I think if you <laughs> saw me run, I actually recently looked up the definition of run because <laughs> I wasn't sure if I was actually qualifying. <laughs> and what is the exact definition of run? <laughs> yeah, well, they had a couple, but one is is that uh, you know both feet are off the ground at the same time or something like that. I said, oh, I, I definitely do not qualify then. <laughs> maybe fall into the category of power walker i think one foot has to yeah, be on the ground yeah, maybe. <laughs> you know i do uh, i do half marathons now and i'm I, my goal this year is to get back to a marathon and then hopefully if i can do it well i, I want to try and go for more ultra marathon distances but uh but every time you know how they take the pictures when you're running yeah and, and so you know every time i look at my picture i never see both feet off the ground. In fact, I, I rarely even see one foot off the ground. <laughs> so I'm just like, I don't know if I'm really running or not. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know what? If you're making the effort, I'd say you're still running in my books. Yeah. 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 So I'm, I'm interested to get into uh, picking your brain here, Rick. So one of the things that really intrigues me is that you're trying to help people overcome pain without, you know, the use of medications or, or surgeries, you know, and, um, that's very intriguing for me because honestly, my breakfast is uh, an Advil and two Tylenol almost, almost, you know, probably four to five times a week to deal with stuff. So I guess, you know, why don't we uh, let you talk about us or let you talk about how we go about eliminating pain naturally without having to kind of rely on those medications? Sure. Well, the first thing that pain is a signal that something is wrong now. So if you fix it now, your pain will go away very rapidly. It's because we have the internal mechanisms in our body to heal. If you cut your finger, it, it mends. If you break a bone, it heals. So we have all of these really great internal mechanisms to, to heal. If we're having some kind of chronic pain, it means that there is some barrier that's stopping us from actually completely healing. And because I'm a physical therapist, my focus is musculoskeletal issues that are the barriers. Uh, I get in a little bit to the dietary and also emotional psychological barriers, but most of it is a musculoskeletal issue. And so really what's going on with most chronic or nagging issues is that there are, are, there are movement habits that are creating tighter, weak uh, muscles that are then straining or hammering vulnerable tissues in your body. And so one of the, one of the most uh, common chronic pain issues is like back pain. 
And I believe that back pain is one of the most chronic issues because it's the most commonly misunderstood issue. And so I, I can kind of give you an idea of my approach to solving things. If, if, if you want, I'll, I'll take you through a little test for back pain so you can determine like what the pattern is that's causing Absolutely. your, your listeners. Okay. It's, that it's pretty simple. Effect. That would be fantastic. And I know that you've, um, amongst your many books that you've, one of your numerous books, Rick, is fixing your back pain. So yes, I'd be curious to hear some of the theory behind that as well. Yeah, we can go as deeply into this. So there, there are basically three patterns of issues that happen with the body that contribute to back and or sciatic pain. So I'm going to show you one of them and we can talk about the second one because that's pretty important too. The third is fairly rare. So we won't, you know, spend time on that. You guys probably want to get into knee pain and foot pain and stuff like that too. So, so we'll, we'll breeze through this really quickly. So let's do, just go through a test. Those of you who have back pain, even if you don't, this would be a great test for you to understand something that, that may be influencing your back pain. So lie down on the floor with your legs straight. And if you can't get on the floor, then get on your couch or get on your bed. But a floor is better because it's a firmer surface. It will give you more feedback into your body and so you understand what, what the results of the test are. So let's say you're lying down on the floor right now on your back with your legs straight. And you can even take your hand and put it underneath your low back and you can feel the distance between your back and the floor in this position. And if you're not doing this right now, uh, you can probably visualize this, but I, I really strongly recommend that if at all you've ever had back pain to do this test because listening to the, me speak about it, you're gonna say, oh yeah, that makes sense. And then 15 minutes after this podcast is over, you're going to forget all about it. But if you actually do the test and feel the truth of this in your body, you will never forget the, the reality of, of this in your body. So we've been lying on the, back, on, our, on the floor with our legs straight now and feeling what your back feels like here. Now I'm going to ask you to bend your knees so your feet are flat on the floor. And if you don't notice a change in your back uh, discomfort, then go ahead and hug your knees to your chest if you prefer. And Sean, I bet since you have had back pain or have it now, you probably have one position you know that feels better than the other, leg straight or knees bent. Which one would make you feel better for your back pain? Give me one. I'm going to go on the ground and do this right now real quick. Yeah, go second. for it. I'm going to yeah. I'll give you a fair answer. Hold on. Sure. Okay. Sean's in the process of testing out this. We're, we're going to edit out all of those exercises that you were just doing there, Sean. All right. So thankfully I'm having, uh, you know, a pretty good day where I'm not having yeah. a lot of pain, but definitely more comfortable with my knees bent. My feet on Exactly. The yeah. That is 99% of all the people who have back pain will answer the same way. Okay. So now here comes the second. And so the easy, uh, easy conclusion to come to is that, oh, well, when my legs are straight, my back is more arched. And when my knees are bent, my back is flatter. So I need to make my back flatter in order to, to help my back pain. But that's, that's part of the answer, but not all of it. So here's the second part of the test. Now stand up and listen to the next five minutes of this podcast. And what you'll notice is after a minute or two of standing that your knees start to lock backwards, okay? This is an energy conservation move that you do that's really an unconscious maneuver, all right? You just lock them. Now you don't have to use your muscles to hold you up. But you'll notice that, and if you haven't locked your knees yet, uh, then go ahead and do that, do that now. And you'll feel what's going on with your back in this position. Now go ahead and unlock your knees just a little bit. You don't have to squat, but just unlock them and feel what just happened to your back there. Okay. Now go ahead and lock the knees one more time. And you'll notice that when your knees are locked, your back is more arched. And when your knees are softer, your back is flatter. So what does this mean? Well, we learned in the first test that when you're lying on your back and your legs are straight and your back is more arched, you don't, your back doesn't like that as much as when it's flatter. In the second test, we learned that your normal way of standing when you're standing for more than a minute or two is to start locking your knees, which then arches your back. So this is how your behaviors are feeding the biomechanical problems causing your back pain, all right? And it's not only standing that people are locking their knees, this is primarily an issue with people walking. Most people walk while locking their knees. This is turning off key muscles in the whole lower body chain. We can get into that if you want to. But basically what it's doing is every time you lock that knee, you arch your back. So if you're walking, if you're taking 10,000 steps a day, that's 10,000 little hammers that are hammering your back. So in my clinic, what I typically do 
uh, and, and virtually almost everyone who has back pain has been locking their knees, it seems. <laughs> so if, if I get people to unlock their knees, and usually I, I put a little piece of tape, tape on the backs of their knees to help remind them, in about three days, most people's back pain is reduced by about between 40 and 70%. Just from this one habit change alone, because you're removing all of those hammers on your back. So that's kind of what my, my method is about, is not only understanding which muscles that are tight or weak are contributing to your pain, but also the behaviors that you're doing that are contributing to those tight or weak muscles that are causing your pain. If you just stretch or strengthen something, it might feel better temporarily, but you're doomed to rinse and repeat for the rest of your life. Better to just change how you're using your body so those things never come back again. It's interesting. Uh, one thing that popped out to my mind right away is he said habits. And I, I uh, came across a quote uh, just last night that said, um, you know, you got to work towards habit because habit overcomes habit. So you get a good habit to overcome your bad habit, right? Yeah. And, yeah. And, 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 and you're so right. I think that, uh, you know, we spend all this time kind of stretching and, and going out, like even I've gone, you know, chiropractic treatments and you feel great after the treatments. And then it's a matter of time before you're back there again with the same complaints, because, you know, unbeknownst to me that you really shed a light upon this is that, you know, our unconscious habits of doing those locking the knees. And like you said, to conserve energy really does kind of detriment our back, which, which is what we're talking about right now. So really, exactly. really interesting insights there. Yeah. So what you're kind of hitting upon is the different. So I call this a component thinking approach, going to a chiropractor or physical therapist or massage therapist, they'll do a treatment that makes you feel better temporarily. And what they're doing is targeting specific tissues, all right, or joints in your body. But what they're not looking at is the whole system together that's causing the vulnerability in that joint or tissue. Mm -hmm. So in physical therapy, and I was trained this way in physical therapy, we have a million tests to identify which tissue is torn, strained, you know, which joint has, is arthritic or whatever. Uh, and we have x-rays and MRIs. We have thousands of tests that say which tissue is damaged, but we have zero tests that tell us why that tissue is damaged. And so what I think about, I, I call this component thinking is how we're trained because we're trained to identify the tissues. And that works really great for acute issues. But when we deal with chronic or nagging issues, there's a different set of rules that are happening. Uh, and so that's when you have to have this, instead of a component approach, or in addition to a, co a component approach, you need to have a systems approach. And we're not trained in that way in physical therapy or chiropractic or in healthcare in general. Very true. Very true. Um, I, I don't know if I mentioned this to you. So um, my day job, I work as a paramedic, so we deal with acute issues and, and a large number of the calls that we go to are, fee, are for people with acute back pain where they're, they can't get up on the, you know, they're, they're down right. and out and they can't move. So they've ended up having to call 911 and, uh, yeah, it's, it's generally, you know, a chronic issue, but then for whatever reason, they ended up having this acute episode where now they they've lost all mobility because of this excruciating pain. So, you know. Our, our initial front frontline front treatment is to load them up with some medications and get them to the hospital and, and hopefully they follow up with, you know, uh, care afterwards. But I think um, kind of what we're talking about now is that, you know, even if you go to somebody who's just focusing on that one tissue or that one area, you're not looking at the system and then you're doomed to kind of repeat it like you had just said. So um, you, you've developed a uh, fixing you method, which, which I'd like to get into now. So, um, I guess you've obviously recognized a pattern and probably through the clientele you've seen over the past 25 years and thought there's got to be a better way to kind of help these people. So is that kind of how you develop this method? And, and what is that method exactly? Yeah, well, uh, I developed the method because I was a, an incredible failure as a physical therapist when I graduated. So my first job, I was in a rural community. There were maybe two therapists there and I, I could help people with acute issues because that was my training, right? this component thinking, but when it came to chronic issues, it was hit or miss whether I could help anyone. And usually it was miss. And so, you know, I was sunk into a deep depression because I really felt that this was my calling. I really wanted to be good at this. And I found that I, I'm not good at it. And so uh, I eventually moved here to Denver and I went to work at a, a, you know, elite health club downtown. And my schedule was 
instantly filled with people with chronic and nagging injuries. And these are all people in their 20s to 60s or 70s, well-to-do, had insurance, you know, could see anyone they, and had seen everyone, and still they had chronic and nagging injuries, a lot of athletes. And I'm just like, holy smokes, that's when it first dawned on me that, oh, it's not just me who's a failure. Medicine in general is, is failing to see what's going on with chronic pain conditions. And so that's when I decided, yeah, I've got to figure this out. I mean, I could either quit or I could try and figure it out. And so I just decided, you know, I might as well just try and figure this out. And so that's what I've been doing this last 25 years. So what the approach is, uh, is based on Dr. Shirley Sarman's, uh, uh, she's a researcher and physical therapy uh, PhD out of Washington University in St. Louis, has written a couple of texts, has taught many seminars and courses and so forth on movement impairment syndrome. So I learned the basic biomechanics from her. But then what happened is uh, the next tier of patients started knocking on my door. And that's when I started lo looking further and I found Thomas Myers' work with anatomy trains and fascial superhighways that connect our head to our feet. And, and then, you know, that helped me understand things further away from pain that may be contributing to pain. And then, but then the next tier of patients knocked on my door and these people seemed to have a battery that was recharging their body to be locked into these painful patterns. And so that's when I discovered Thomas Hanna's work and he deals with neurological uh, uh, basis of patterns of pain in the body and how to treat that. So here's the really interesting thing. Dr. Shirley Sarman, Thomas Myers and Thomas Hanna, all three different types of researchers are focusing in three different areas of medicine all found the same three patterns of issues causing almost all people's back pain. And that's when I, my, the light bulb exploded, you know, and I'm just like, oh my God, this is the, this is what's going on. And so what I've been doing is, is delving into why those patterns are occurring in the body. And so like the knee locking thing that we just went over, that's just one of those little innocent little behaviors that are creating ripple effects in our body. So the fixing you method is a combination of these three approaches, uh, but really it's it's fixing the behavior and fixing the tighter weak muscles that are, are that are happening because of the behavior. Okay, very interesting. Um, one question that's just popped to mind is, would you have any idea of how long it takes somebody to kind of overcome the previous behaviors and adopt the new ones that you're trying to ingrain in, into their bodies and minds? Yeah, very short. For for instance. So uh, pain is a great motivator. And so one of the techniques that we use in, in my clinic is a test retest strategy. So what I do is, uh, you know, someone says they have back or sciatic pain. I said, what's, what's, what behavior is causing that? I have them do that behavior. I've already done my exam. I understand what the elements are that are causing their pain. So I have them do one exercise and then I have them redo that behavior again. Is your pain better? Oh yeah. That's a lot better. Okay, great. This is the exercise you're going to be doing. It's a test retest strategy to understand exactly which exercises are solving your pain. So uh, that's one of the ways to get at the root of this stuff really quickly is is doing this test retest strategy. Did I answer your question, Sean? I'm not sure. Yeah, you did absolutely. It, it seems that you're with with that approach. You're really uh, personalizing everybody's treatment plan it's not just a blanket treatment like here follow this see, it, right. see you later right you're you're actually looking at them as an individual and as that unique system and then um tailoring their treatment to that which is yeah well here, here's the, also the interesting thing uh is that if you look at my books like my back pain book i think russell that you mentioned maybe uh you know there's like 80 different exercises and recommendations in that book because i was trying to solve every possible thing that could go wrong with the back, right? And then when I bought my clinic, I've, I've owned it for about 10 years and saw a huge volume of people and all of my therapists too. And so that's when I realized, oh my gosh, the same patterns of issues are happening behind almost everyone's pain. So if, if the same pattern in you, Sean, might cause central back pain, and sci but sciatica in another person or SI joint pain in another. And so if I can just solve the pattern, then we solve your pain. So that's how I've been able to create these downloadable home programs that are much more streamlined than what is in my books. 
uh, and and they're guided. So, and and the why it's manifesting differently in you is maybe your genetics, maybe your exercise history, your work history, your emotional self, you know, your dietary issues, all sorts of things, old injuries that you've had. All of that matters in how these these patterns are creating the type of pain in you. That all makes perfect sense. So one of the most common types of pain for runners specifically, as we know, is knee pain, otherwise known as runner's knee. I, I'm curious, Rick, what are the most common ways to develop knee pain? And what would be your main methodologies in order to strengthen the knees? Yeah. So the assumption is that it's a strength issue, but uh, runners have incredibly strong legs typically, right? So Absolutely. maybe it's not a strength issue. So one of the things that I found, you know, that's really missing, I don't see anyone talking about, there, there's uh, something called femoral retroversion and femoral antiversion. Have you guys ever heard of this before? Could you repeat the name of that again? <laughs> femoral antiversion and femoral retroversion. Have you ever no, heard I've never it? heard that terminology, no. Okay, it, it, this is this is what perplexes me is that it is so critical, especially for runners and athletes to understand this concept. This is what's missing from a lot of their training and understanding of what they're doing. So they're big sounding and scary sounding words, but really simple ideas. So the thigh bone is shaped differently in different people. Some people have thigh bones that are twisted outward. That's called for more retroversion. Some people have thigh bones that are twisted inward. That's called femoral antiversion. Men typically have lean towards the femoral retroversion side, and females typically lean more towards the femoral antiversion side. So there are consequences to this behavior. So if you have femoral retroversion, it means that the thigh bone is twisted out. Well, the thigh bone is half of the knee joint, all right? So if your foot is pointed forward, when you, and you have a more uh, a, an externally rotated thigh bone like that, then the thigh bone is trying to turn out while you are trying to turn it back in by pointing your foot forward. This is creating torque at the knee joint. Why is your foot pointed in? Most, most, in most cases, it's because we're socialized to believe our feet should be pointed forward when we're standing and walking. But for guys, this typically is not the case. We, and so by pointing the foot forward, you're now introducing torque into the knee joint and torque is not good in the body. It's useful for translating one type of movement to another, but not good with repeated movement. So one simple solution for most of the runners that I saw, male runners with knee pain, almost all of them had some degree of more retroversion, yet they were walking with their foot pointed forward. And so, well, I would so, so simply, hey, let's, choose, let's point the toes out maybe three to five degrees while you're walking. Let's not change anything about how you're running. Let's just focus on the walking for now because most of us are spending much more time walking than we are running. So let's fix the walking at first and see what that does. Usually that's all that's needed. I, I really get, a, I, I don't like to change people's running patterns. Most people are really scared to change their running pattern. And unless they're really desperate, then and are begging me to take to look at their running pattern i'll be happy to offer some some advice but mostly i deal with their walking pattern which often solves the problem so for more retroversion knowing whether this is happening in you is a really critical piece of information because not only is it just a purely mechanical thing there's a little tiny muscle behind the knee here called the popliteus muscle and it runs from the inside of the lower leg bone to the outside of the upper thigh bone. So it's crossing here. And its job is to prevent knee hyperextension, right? But it also helps control rotation because it's crossing rotationally like this. When you introduce this torque by turning your foot in or not aligning your foot with your knee, that muscle starts to get into spasm. And what it does is, if you can imagine wringing out a, a cloth the more you wring that cloth, the closer your two hands come together because you're introducing now compression into the equation. As this contracts and you, and, you, uh, and you develop more rotation, compression now happens. So now you've added compression in the knee joint on top of the rotation and a spasm muscle that's holding all of that in place. 
And that's the missing link behind most people's chronic knee pain issues. Interesting. So what you're saying really is, is the, the foot position is kind of uh, counteracting the rotation of the femur bone or the thigh bone. And you're trying to correct that by just making a minor adjustment in, in the angle of the pointing of the toes. So would the opposite be for, for the vast majority of women that have the opposite rotation, would they be looking to move their toes inward then? Well, I, I caution against that because internal rotation of the lower body system equals more compression. Okay. All right. So what's going on with more antiversion, is, and it's a great question, Sean. So the thigh bone is twisted inward. And like I said, internal rotation often equals more compression. So right off the bat, women are at our disadvantage if they have an antiverted femur, right? So what we want to do is we want to control the degree of internal rotation that's occurring. Well, we can try usually pointing the foot forward is as much control as we want to do mechanically like that. The other area of control then would be muscularly. Okay. So what is the primary external rotator of the thigh bone? The butt muscles. All right. So what we then do is, and most, and so if you have antiverted femurs, you need to have stronger butt muscles than people who don't have antiverted femurs. And what that will do is it will decelerate the internal rotation of that thigh bone. It may not stop it, but if we can decelerate it so it's not a hard hammer, hitting on the hip joint or the knees, knee joints, and it becomes the soft little hammer, that's what we're looking for with that, okay? okay? So how, what, why, would the thought, why would the butt muscles be weak? Again, it goes back to the gait patterns that we're having when we're walking. If we're locking our knees during the day when we walk, then the, it shuts off the butt muscles. And then what that does, then we've lost the whole external rotator control of that thigh bone and power generator. Right. And then suddenly we run and we expect that thing to just perform just perfectly. Right. And it's, it's not because it's not been conditioned to be turning on neurologically as often as it should be by the brain in your walking pattern. You can do a thousand lunges and squats. Yes, that will activate it. But that activation doesn't carry over into gait patterns because gait patterns involve knee flexion. That's like 10 to 20 degrees here. And so that's where you want your butt, because that's where your knee is when you're running too, somewhere around here. If your butt only turns on when you're doing deep squats or lunges down here, it doesn't translate into this functional pattern here. Right. So it's not a question of strength. It's a question of neurological activation at that point. Right. I really appreciate for the people who are not watching on YouTube, but uh, Rick has a mini uh, skeleton with him. So he's, he's using that as a visual aid. It's really helping uh, supplement what he's saying. So if you have a chance go over to the YouTube channel and, and watch that, cause it's really gonna make it uh, make a lot more sense for you. So Rick, I wanna, I wanna move down the chain a little bit. We're talking about knees. Um, I wanna ask you about Achilles too, cause it's another um, common and, and quite devastating injury for runners. It really kind of lays them up for quite some time. Um, what, what do you have to say about that, about Achilles uh, tendon injuries and things like that? Okay. I, I, so before we go into that, I just want to go into one more issue about knees. Sure. Because there are so many types of knee pain that are diagnosed out there. But it's all, like I said, it's all coming down to the same pattern of dysfunction. So let's say that you have an, an antiverted femur and your thigh bone is rotating in excessively. Well, you've got a thigh muscle that's coming down from the pelvis here and you know, attaches to the kneecap, right? And so if the thigh bone is rotating in uncontrolled, the line of pull from the pelvis to the kneecap though has not changed because the pelvis isn't internally rotating. So now you've got a muscle that's holding the kneecap here while the thigh bone is rotating in. That then creates tracking issues in the knee joint. And we've all heard of like anterior femoral or uh, anterior knee pain syndrome and, oh, you know, lateral migration of the patella with, you know, knee injuries and so forth. That's because the whole system is collapsing in underneath the kneecap. It's not that the kneecap, I mean, some cases it's that the IT band is too tight. That may be another part of the problem. But if you've been stretching your IT band and you're still not solving your knee tracking issue, 
or you've got a chronic knee tracking issue, it, it's in my experience with a lot of athletes, it's because the thigh bone is still rotating in uncontrolled. And therefore, relatively, the knee is traveling outside of that groove of the kneecap of, of the of the thigh bone. Does that make sense, that explanation? It does for sure. And it's it's incredibly useful knowledge, Rick. And it's it it's an interesting cause and effect relationship between the different muscle parts and how that affects the knee specifically. Right. I, so getting into Sean's question with regards yes. to Achilles, Achilles pain, I've actually known some runners who have dealt with Achilles pain. And so curious to hear your theories and practices behind Achilles pain to, in, in reference to Sean's question. Yeah. So uh, you guys are, are ultra runners, right? And you're and we you're are. probably really good runners because you have a good running form. And good running form, uh, and ultra running at least, dictates that you should be more of a forefoot striker than you are of a heel foot striker. Correct? Absolutely. Right. So if we're striking on the forefoot, what are we using? We're using our, our calves. Our calf soleus complex, yeah. right? And usually, uh, uh, so now you've activated neurologically these, these muscles are really dialed in with your brain. Your okay. brain says like, oh yeah, you're going to do a hundred miles. I'm going to be turning this thing on all day long, right. To prepare for this. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> so there's a consequence to that though. And which is that that becomes too activated. And so when the knee is trying to pass over the foot like this, you need calf and soleus length to allow that to occur. You not only need length though, you need it to neurologically turn off to a degree to allow that, that to happen. Does that make sense? So because- In, in essence, the, the longer your calves are with your forefoot strike, the, the more likely you are to feel strong while you're running? So in essence, the, the more you forefoot strike and the more you activate the calf muscle, the more it's going to have a difficult time letting go of that neurological activation to allow the knee to pass over the foot. All right. It's got to lengthen at some point. And if it's constantly contracting, it's going to have a hard time lengthening as a result. And it's not only a pure length issue, it's because it's, it's activated to a point where it can't shut down and allow the lengthening to occur. Does that make sense? Yes, definitely. Okay, so let's tackle, I don't want to change people's running form, so let's tackle the length part of this equation, all right? What could we do that lengthens the calf and soleus muscle? Well, I'm sure everyone out here has been doing calf and soleus stretches for years, <laughs> but, but they still find that the problem persists, right? And it's because they're not dealing with the problem at its root. And what I have found at, at, at the at the root of tight calf and soleus complex is our sleeping patterns, all right? So when we sleep on our back, our foot typically points away like this under the covers. That is a calf and soleus shortening position, right? If we roll to our side, if, you, if you're a side sleeper, you'll notice that your feet typically are pointed away from you like this, which means that you are actively contracting your calf and soleus complex at night while you're sleeping to assume this position that you're running in for so many hours a day, right? And if you're a stomach sleeper, well, then the bed is pushing the foot into this position. Right. So what I have found after being frustrated as a physical therapist, getting people to stretch their calves and the problem keeps coming back is that I finally realized, oh, it has nothing to do with stretching. It has everything to do with people's sleeping behaviors. And so what I recommend people do is there's something called a dorsal night split. And what it does is it holds your foot in a neutral position. So now you don't have six or eight hours of shortening of your calf and soleus complex at night. And you wake up with a lengthened calf soleus complex. This is what usually is the key to unlocking the chronic strain to a Achilles tendon issue. Because now that it starts off longer, the knee can pass over the ankle easier. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So you're, you're passively with the use of that splint increasing the range of motion to the point where you have that flexibility, if you will, while you're running, right? 
Yeah, well, you can look at it as increasing the range of motion. I look at it as decreasing the the shortening pattern behavior right. that you're that you're in. So, because if we put all we need to do is have the foot in a neutral position, we're not stretching anything. Right. Right. We're just not letting it contract or shorten anymore for six or eight hours at a time. Right. So that's the beauty of it. Is it, it is passive. It doesn't take any of your time. The problem is is that especially with a lot of runners and distance runners is that the calf and soleus is so contracted that what they'll soon discover is that it's actively contracted at night. And when they put that dorsal night splint on, they're going to be pushing against something. It'll be like doing an eight hour repetition of calf strengthening. Right. And so pretty soon this whole complex is going to start burning like crazy. And they, in the middle of the night, most people take it off and they throw it across the room. I hear this all the time. I don't know what happened. I noticed that my dorsal night swim was across the room when I woke up this morning. And that's why is because it's so uncomfortable. So what you have to do is be really careful when you start with something like this. And what I, a lot of people get up in the middle of the night to pee. So I have them start, put it on after you get up to pee and then, you know, lengthen the second half of your night instead of the first half, right? Then you get to wake up with the benefit of a slightly lengthened calf and soleus complex in the morning, rather than if you did it at the beginning of the evening and you kicked it off in the middle of the night, then you've just lost all the benefit because you've had the second half of the night like this all night long. Right. This is actually the, the key behind solving chronic plantar fasciitis. And that's another this thing is, that, that runners have, have dealt with yes, chronically exactly. as well, right? So. so what's happening is the knee, once again, needs to pass over the ankle, all right? If the calf and soleus complex is too uh, contracted or short to allow that to happen, well, that have you guys ever like turned around and run into a wall or a door that you didn't know was there or a table? A pole. A yep. pole. Like, yep, absolutely. All right. <laughs> and, and even with just half a step, do you remember the force, how much that hurt to run into something that you didn't know was there? Terrible. So our, <laughs> yeah. Our, it's like getting tackled by a lamp, linebacker, you know? So our bodies are generating tremendous forces to move forward. Okay. So now that force though is restricted by a cut tight calf and soleus complex. So where does that force go though? Because you have to go forward. What happens? The force can go into two places, up to the knee, or it'll go down to the foot. Okay. The foot has 26 bones in it. So it has 26 joints to accommodate that force, but it only has one planta, plantar fascia that, that unites all of those joints. So what's happening is that force is then being driven down into the arch of the foot because as the foot collapses, it allows the whole shin to come forward, right? And now you get the motion that your body's trying to do. Well, you get that at the expense of overly stretching that plantar fascia, right? And its job is to decelerate that that flattening and spring you back up. Well, once again, if you've got all of this tremendous force pushing it down all day long, then it stays too lengthened and it strains it. And that's, that's why you, when you get up in the middle of the night or in the morning and your foot's been like this all night long, where you have that shortened that, right? This, this plantar fascia gets a chance to heal, but then you step on it, boom. And right, you're right back again with the tight calf and soleus driving excessive force into the bottom of the foot again. Which is very, not very ideal thorough explanation. Whatsoever. Sorry, Russell, go ahead. Which is not ideal whatsoever. And so based on all of this, I mean, so clearly it, I, I tend to sleep straight through the night and your, your recommendation based on the first half night of the sleep and then the second half night of the sleep I typically that's not going to work for me. I'm not one to wake up in the middle of the night. Usually, I mean, the odd night I do. Wait till you get older, Russell. <laughs> well, uh, he's still the other 20s, thing I was so going to say is, <laughs> based on all this, gonna... should I be trying to bring my? So I'll I'll bring my foot up. So instead of having my foot pointed outwards, um, like this all night, then I should try to lock it in all night in order to in order to lengthen the calf muscles yeah so, so russell 
how successful do you think you'll be when you're unconscious at, at locking I don't that think, in? I don't you think won't be so. successful at all. It, it, it will it will snap back into right. me sending the Once foot. you fall right. into a deep sleep, you've just lost that. So why not just get something exterior to hold it in the correct place? It's the easiest way. So you may not wake up in the middle of the night because you're young, but if you wear that dorsal night splint and you're actively contracting your calf, you will be waking up in the middle of the night. <laughs> Absolutely. So, <laughs> for better Rick, or for worse. Yeah. So Rick, one of the questions I had for you, and I think we've, we've, we've touched upon it throughout the conversation, um, you know, and that question was, you know, is there anything that younger athletes or runners can do to mitigate injuries or chronic activity related pain as they age? So I think we've kind of just touched upon that now as to, you know, kind of taking these steps when you're younger, such as what we were just talking about with Russell, um, to avoid those things from happening in the future. But, um, you know, they say prevention is, is a great way to, to practice medicine, I guess. Um, so would you recommend people coming to see you or to checking out your books or downloading your programs prior to actually becoming injured and experiencing pain? Is there benefit for, for them to do that while they're healthy and pain-free? Absolutely. Because who likes to deal with injuries, especially as an athlete? right? Mm -hmm. The most frustrating thing in the world to, to have to deal with an injury, especially, and then one that becomes a nagging injury. Yeah. So why not learn about your body before? And, and frankly, uh, this is, this is why a lot of, uh, attorneys don't bring me into a courtroom to testify for someone who's been in an auto accident, because the assumption is if they had pain before the auto accident, and now they have pain after the auto accident, that the, their pain is due to the auto accident. No, that's a, the assumption is, is that the body was perfect before that auto, auto accident, and, and which it almost never is. So what that accident is doing is, is uh, exposing a vulnerability in the body because there's been a, usually a systemic breakdown of function over the years. It's the same thing with young people, right? If you have no injury, it doesn't mean your body is working perfectly. It just means because our bodies have all of these redundant systems to take over and, you know, compensate for these issues that we are developing. So it's only when the last straw has been broken or you have a fall or something like that, that then pain occurs. Well, by that time, all of the other redundant systems have been worn away and then you have to go. And that's why it's hard to fix a chronic issue is because you're trying to address it from oh, this tissue is damaged, I've got to fix this tissue, when in reality, your whole system has been damaged for a long time. It only makes sense to fix the system before that chronic issue happens, especially if you're serious about being an athlete, I feel. Yeah, I think that that's well said. And, and you know, for, from the athlete perspective or the runner perspective, you want to keep yourself in the game for as long as you can. And I know when I started running uh, just over 10 years ago, you know, my, my goal was to not make it to a marathon or not run an ultra marathon. My goal was to be able to run hopefully for the rest of my life. Right. So if I make it into my eighties, I'd like to still be running or, or I was being moving around into my eighties. Right. And, and yeah. suffering from, you know, chronic pain can really um, deter you from doing that. And then you had kind of mentioned too, it can also affect your mental health as well. Right. Being, being in that kind of chronic pain state, it's, it can really make you grumpy. <laughs> oh Yeah hugely grumpy and frustrated. So, uh, yeah, I'm with yeah. you. Um, I wanted to uh, talk about your, your newest book in your, your collection, solving the pain puzzle. Has that book been released this year yet? There it is right there. Solving there the pain is. puzzle. So let's it's talk released. about this book. Um, okay. what, what can readers or listeners of the podcast expect when they pick up the book? Well, the, the, it's called solving the pain puzzle. And then the subtitle is cases in 25 years as a physical therapist. So what these are are cases that I've had in the clinic of pain from head to toe and how I've used these principles we've been talking about to solve them. So the previous books I wrote uh, were all about the biomechanics and had a lot of anatomy and so forth in it to describe what was going on, all that kind of stuff. Well, in, the, in those books, I had these little client connection stories. And over the years that, that, you know, showed how I use that with clients, but they were only like a paragraph or two. And I had so many comments over the years. It's like, Hey, what happens to that one person? That sounded a lot like me. 
So I thought, you know, what, what if I wrote the story, the book from the client, the patient's perspective this time, instead of the biomechanic and anatomy perspective. And this might be a better way for people to absorb this information. Uh, and so this is my attempt at, at doing that. I think it's, it's a really interesting book. I think my hope is that it gives people hope that, that they can solve their pain and that they understand, oh my gosh, this guy's looking at the whole body. You mean physical therapists haven't been trained to do this? Because the assumption is, is that we have been, and no, we have not. We've been trained in this component thinking approach and that's what we're, we've been missing. And that's what I hope the book, book shows, you know, teaches people. And there, by the way, there are free chapters that people can read from the book on my website if they want to check it out. Amazing. Yeah, and that's rickolderman.com. We'll put that in the show notes for sure. Um, it mentions here that uh, you have some uh, home programs as well as other other things in the book that are available. Tell us a little yeah. bit about that. So I, I wrote my other series of books about 10 or 15 years ago, and th those are the Fixing You series. Mm -hmm. And those are to help people understand and solve their pain. And they're much more complicated and unguided than these current home programs. But what they taught me was, my suspicion was, if we understood how to use our bodies better, we wouldn't have pain. And I believe that everyone should be able to fix their own pain. I don't feel that you, sh we're not born needing to go to a practitioner to fix us. If we just have the right information, we should be able to do that ourselves. And everything that you and all of both, or the three of us have talked about today has been about, they're all things that you can do to solve your pain, right? And so anyway, after owning my clinic for 10 years and seeing that these patterns are happening, oh, I can make this so much simpler for people. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I, I, I uh, also kind of improved the teaching that I did in, in, the, in the book too. So this is, and that, what I also learned is that people like videos. They don't want to read something to, to fix their pain. And so that's why I've just created, this is a pure video download. For people it's the videos of the you know the exercises the somatics audio lessons i have taping techniques in there and i have videos of changing movement habits that are causing pain so it's a very comprehensive but very simple system like for instance the pain reduction exercises i think there's maybe seven for back pain just seven exercises that get at the root of all of the biomechanical principles that we've been talking about today Wonderful. I, th I think I think this uh, this program you've developed is a great way to kind of reach a larger audience. And, um, you know, I think most of our audience as runners and stuff, we try to kind of do things on our own and, and, and improve ourselves. And this is something that's that's hugely important to, to keep ourselves in as as a great physical condition as we can be. But, you know, you had mentioned, um, you know, a lot of the people that you're seeing early on in your career, you said, you know, they were well to do and had insurance and had seen all the practitioners that they could and they were still having problems I think that you know uh in Canada you know we're we're quite popular for our you know our universal health care but but universal health care does not include physical therapy does not include chiropractic those are all paid for by private benefits or out-of-pocket expenses so to get this book as a resource and and to have your programs there I think it is is highly beneficial for for everybody across the board yeah I I agree Sean and and really uh, people have been led to believe that they're broken because no one has been able to fix them before. But, and, and as a therapist, it's, it, you know, I was trained in PT school that, you know, if you see someone coming to you, who's been to a, a ton of other therapists and they haven't gotten better, it's a big red flag that we're probably not going to have much success. But now I see that as the exact opposite. I was always excited to get people who had failed everyone else because I know exactly how they've been approached and it's from this component thinking approach. And so, uh, and it, it bore out when I treated them, you know, in my clinic, I expected at least probably uh, 30 to 50% improvement in one to three visits. And that's the, the rate that I expect people to get better applying this information. And so uh, it does put all of it back into their hands where it should have been in the first place. It's just that we haven't been trained in medicine to put it into people's hands really like this before. And so I, I was going to say that, you know, I've got lots of reviews on my books for the Fiction News series that I wrote 10 years ago. And that proves to me that people with no knowledge of any anatomy whatsoever 
can solve their pain. If you have the desire, you can solve it. You just need the right information. Wonderful. Um, I, I think it's going to be a great resources. Uh, Rick, it's been great having you on the show. Uh, you're clearly full of knowledge and, you know, your desire to help people has kind of brought you down this path to develop these systems and these books that, that are really quite unique and I think uh, make a lot of sense, to be honest. Um, so Rick Olderman, you're also the host of the Talk About Pain podcast. So uh, Trail Tales ARP family, let's show Rick some support and get some knowledge and help yourself as well. And check out the podcast, check out his books. You can go to rickolderman.com for more information. I will link all of that to the show notes. And Rick, uh, good luck in your own running journey. We hope that you make it to that ultra marathon level and we'd love to hear about it uh, once the time comes. So as we say here at Trail Tales ARP, Russell, go ahead and wild. run wild, my friend. Run wild, Rick. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you, guys. I really enjoyed it. And that's a wrap on this episode of Trail Tales ARP, a running podcast from Sean Solbon and Russell the Runner. Thank you very much for listening. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram at trail underscore tales underscore ARP. Check out our YouTube channel at Trail Tales ARP. And you can catch us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts from. Please don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. Catch you next time. Run wild. Stop it up.